And we're going to have a safety panel, a panel to discuss safety issues. During the last several meetings of the BSC, you know that we've heard reports of increasing assaults and violence against reporters and crews. And these are, these are mainly street crimes against street reporters. And we've learned at our last meeting that uh, there were more than 100 incidents in the last year just in the Bay Area alone. In New York recently, a man with a gun, it turned out to be a toy gun, I believe, was seen waving into the background of a reporter's live shot. And this is a special issue for me. Some of the current political candidates have really used anger against the news media to whip up enthusiasm for their, for their uh, candidacies. I think this is very poisonous and not to mention very dangerous. As you know, at our national convention, we passed a resolution calling on the national board to find ways to identify and implement measures to enhance, enhance journalist safety. Now, this is an important issue for our members, so we need to talk about it and try to come up with some proposals if we can. Anna Calderon helped put together this panel of local journalists seated before you who are face this issue every single day. So I hope that we can hear their stories and talk about some of the things that need to be done, that can be done. And I really want to focus on that, trying to think of things that we can come up with that can end up as proposals for things that can be done to enhance journalist safety. Julio Ortiz is going to moderate this panel, and I thank him for that. He is a reporter for KMX Channel 3 Univision, covering social justice and immigration issues, as well as being the station's senior mental health reporter. He is truly an award-winning reporter, nominated for 41 local Emmys, winning 20 of them. He's received 14 awards from the Arizona Associated Press Broadcasting Association. He's also received four Edward R. Murrow Regional Awards and three Gabriel Awards from the Catholic Academy of Communications Press uh, Professionals. He has his bachelor's degree in journalism and communication studies from California State University, Northridge, and a master's degree in marriage and family therapy from USC. In fact, I understand this morning he was teaching journalism students at uh, CSUN. He's also, if you recall, from our last BSC meeting in New York, someone who has given this issue of safety a lot of very serious thought, and I appreciate that, and we're all going to benefit from that and uh, from his leadership of this panel. So, Julio, I'll throw it over to you to introduce the rest of the guys. Thank you all. Uh, to those who I haven't said hi, welcome to LA. Uh, this is our uh, home that um, pretty much lives everything when it comes to what are we exposed to in journalism, uh, be it the weather, be it the fan who doesn't understand that we are working on the field. And yes, I've been raising up the issue that I have seen colleagues of mine exposed to dangers that, that uh, administ administrators don't realize that are out there. And today we have a great panel. I'm going to let them introduce themselves to you so you, can, you hear a little bit about them. Um, and more importantly, um, what we want to do with this discussion is take something back to your stations, take something back to your colleagues, and if something resonates of the dangers that, that we discuss and talk about, let's, let's do something about it or bring it to, aware, to an awareness level the, that the news director, the executive producer, understands that these dangers are out there. Um, and uh, somebody that, I don't know if you like danger, Pete, but anytime there is... <laughs> I know if um, they have a phrase for people who like danger. <laughs> it's called an adrenaline junkie. They also yeah. have another phrase for it. So one it's called the, stupid. <laughs> well, one of the things we are, I guess, our, our passion is somewhat. Um, our passion as reporters fell in love with stupidity and dedication to inform. And one of the things, like I hear in the morning at six in the morning, and I know it's very windy. I'm like, Pete's going to be in Granada Hills. So I know he's going to be in Granada Hills. And there he is. You know, well, I can hardly move. The wind is pushing me around. And you know, it's a hundred. It's a hundred and nine degrees. You know, and he's reporting from Woodland Hills. It's a hundred and nine degrees. This is my third, uh, you know, thirst crunch uh, drink from Seven Eleven. It's really hot. Straight water. Straight water. You drink. You drink. And, and I, you know what? How I knew I Pete was here because every time we go to a press conference, he never goes through the process. Like he didn't pick up his badge from this particular day. So here it is. 
he, he takes care of the press conference himself. He coordinates everything. So Pete, it's a really, I, I really like to call it with all respect a daredevil when it comes to being in the story. Because he, he just does it. But as you will learn today, he does it in a way that is safe. But not everyone either has the time or the support from the news team or managers to provide all of these to the employee because we are employees besides reporting. And so I'm gonna go through each one and have you introduce yourself. And each of these individuals, each of these colleagues have something to share with us that are gonna make us go back to our sessions and say, I remember when you know, uh, Pete said this or Maui said this. And that's how change starts, by being aware, not being a therapist. <laughs> be aware, be conscious, and then take action so it changes for your safety and the ones in your colleagues. So, Pete? My name is Pete Demetrio. I'm a reporter for KNX 1070 News Radio. Before that, KFWB News 980. I've been on the streets consecutively and continuously in Los Angeles since 1974. Uh, I feel a little bit of a disadvantage. I don't have the academic background of my colleague here, but I've got a little bit of a more advanced degree. BT, DT, SWU. Been there, done that, still walking upright. <laughs> don't laugh. Some people have not learned those lessons and they are not with us. They're either out of this business or they're dead. And if I sound a little bit grave there, I'm serious. You can get killed in this business. Not necessarily on a battlefield in Iraq or Afghanistan. You can get killed on the streets of LA. I've come close probably a dozen times in the years I've done it. The key is more than just the idea of being a journalist. You're out there, you're focused on the story. That's your job. But over the last 25 or so years, there has been a change in the dynamic of what is happening on the streets and what is happening with the culture that definitely and directly affects a journalist trying to do their job. The media, is now regarded as part of the system. We are part of corporate America. And corporate America having taken its hits, people look at it with a jaundiced eye. In many ways, news crews, reporters are viewed not as reporters, not as impartial, but as biased and that we may not be honest observers. The rise of self-importance also. One thing on this one. Self-importance is a problem of the people at large because many of these people have a sense and most of them are under 30, most are unemployed, they have no direction in life, but they do have things which make it dangerous for us. A desire for instant fame and worth on social media, take your pick. We're gonna go actually a little more in depth about sure. that, and so the rest of the panel can introduce sure. themselves. Uh, as, if you don't know Pete, and you wanna have a great conversation about pretty much anything, <laughs> talk to Pete, he knows a lot, he knows a lot. He, you know, I could have, I'm saying, I can, I can have all the degrees that I, that I can have, but he's a, 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 when it comes to the streets of LA, when it comes to what corners mean something to our reporter, he's the source. If you show up to a story and Pete's there, there's something that is worth stopping by and turning on your camera and reporting. And uh, you'll know him, you'll get to know him a little more. And he's here, in fact, I have seen him all dressed up in the fires, I think in the San Diego fires, when they were like 14 fires. A few of them. I thought he was an actual firefighter. You know, I was like, oh, we can talk to him. And like, here's Pete, like, oh no, not him. <laughs> He's not an official. <laughs> so uh, so you, there, there's a lot of knowledge here. So I hope you can get the best of it and, and just kind of digest it and, and stick it back. Uh, Beverly White is also with us. Um, and she's still going to, going to share with us something that uh, Pete, which it was a great trans transition, uh, mentioned uh, a, a little bit about. It's what are we exposed to? Maybe we're not exposed to somebody um, you know, swinging something at us or throwing something at us. But what about saying something or being exposed to demeaning or, or, uh, or vulgarity or anything that makes us uncomfortable to be on air? It's like somebody's working on the, somebody's making hot dogs and you show up and you start throwing dirt on their hot dogs. You know, you gotta, you gotta respect. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta respect, and in LA, you know that outside Staples Center after our Lakers game, there are about 80 of them. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I've, and I've seen you had them too. You've had them, Pete. Hey. Right? You know, look, it's food. Never turn down food. <laughs> <laughs> Beverly Hill, uh, Be Beverly White. You can call me Beverly Hill. Yeah, no, Beverly Hill. <laughs> turn it up. There we go. Lights it go. 
Thank you, Beverly. I'm Beverly White from KNBC, NBC4 here in Los Angeles. And I work the night shift. So a lot of what Pete goes through, the wind, the rain, the miserable people who don't want you in their street telling their stories and are happy to roll in just before your live moment to tell you so at the top of their lungs, I go through that in the dark. I work every day, Monday through Friday, starting at 3 p.m. So my issues are not just being black and female and on TV, but I work the night side, which adds a lot of extra to the drama. But I am, like Pete, a professional storyteller. Came to LA 23 years ago from Miami, before that Cincinnati, before that San Antonio and Waco, Texas. So I've been in the game for a minute and I'm proud to be union. I'm proud to be with you today and I welcome your questions on the subject of safety. Because yes, a lot of what's thrown at us these days, it's not physical, it's verbal, it's nasty, it's noxious, it's jaw-droppingly stupid. But folks who want to be on television and get their moment and go viral will try to pull that stunt at your expense. How you respond, I think, is a reflection of experience and preparation and keeping your head on swivel. Sometimes you just have to keep the peripheral going. You want to focus on your role cue and your fabulous video and your photographer behind the camera without whom I'm nothing. But respecting all that, it doesn't matter if my moment, my story is derailed by some knucklehead on a skateboard who decides to curse me out with a racist or sexist slur. I won't repeat them all, but there's one that's going around called Effer in the P. If you've never heard it, you will in this conversation. We'll explain a little further, or you can Google it. But about this time last year, it started to really blow up. And I think that's why I was invited to be on this panel because my version, my responses, my take on that has also gone viral. I was interviewed by therap.com on this very subject. And I'm proud of how they handled the story, took it seriously. My boss agrees it was worth sharing. And that's why I'm here today to share it with you and how you can prepare yourself, God forbid it happens to you, or somebody you care about. Because it can distract from your story, but it should not be the story. That's why I'm here. Thank, Thank you for having now we have Christopher Maui. Maui is a photographer. And just like Pete, he sometimes is at a disadvantage because Pete works with both eyes open. And sometimes you have to close one eye to make sure you get the shot. And when that happens, well, some of your angles are not there and Pete covers both flanks and you lose a flank. Tell, tell us a little bit about yourself. Wow, kind of wondering why I agreed to do this in the first place because uh... <laughs> much more comfortable behind the camera and trying to picture everybody naked and that's not working right now, so. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> um, I've been a uh, photojournalist about 15 years. Previously I worked at a commercial station, XCTV San Diego. Um, wow, where to begin? Um, I have a lot of experience doing breaking news, stuff like that. Uh, right now I work at KPBS San Diego where we do a lot, maybe more, you know, stories that are not so, if it bleeds, it leads kind of situation. But I do have some experience I could share with the group. Well, thank we... you for being here with us. Yeah. And we apologize for not being naked. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, except for Pete. He's not apologizing. Um, <laughs> so um, what I learned from uh, Steve, is it Kusich? It's very difficult Kush. to pronounce. Kuj, uh, like the luge Kush. in the Olympics, yeah. Kush. Well, he's been here in LA for three years, correct? And I think um, to have an spectrum from, you know, 23 years here in LA reporting? 40. For, well, on the streets. 40. 23 for me. Oh, 23, 40, 10, seven? 15, 15 years, yeah. So we have a variation. We're gonna have the perspective of somebody who's just been here three years, 10 years, uh, 23, 40, and that pretty much is a lot of wealth of information of what is our experience in the field. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what can you, you know, contribute? What can to I add to this conversation, yes. right? Well, my name's Steve Kuj. I work for KTLA Channel 5 News here in Los Angeles. I've been working here in LA for about three years now. But before this, I was in Phoenix, I was in Atlanta, I was in Augusta, Georgia, where they play the Masters every year. And then before that, way back when, I was actually working in Minneapolis for a newspaper. Um, I only have a fraction of the experiences that Pete and Beverly may have on me. But in the short time that I've been in this game, I've seen a lot. You know, I'm 
I'm probably what you guys may refer to as a gopher, a gopher reporter, as in, hey, Steve, we got reports of shots fired down on South LA, go to that. Or now there's a house fire, go to that. Or we have a, uh, you know, a flood, a water main that broke in Hollywood, go over there. You know, I pretty much cover a wide range of stories, but mostly breaking news stuff, situations where you end up in bad neighborhoods, oftentimes at night when there's nobody around. And I can tell you there's nothing more nerve wracking when you're standing in front of the camera, the AD in your earpiece is counting you down. Okay, you're on in five seconds. Here they're going to toss to you. And as you're looking at the camera, trying to remember what the heck you have to say here about this story that you're on, you've got one or two people coming up behind you. And you can't, you can't just you know, look around all of a sudden because you're about to be on camera. You have to appear professional. And you have no idea what these people are going to do. And oftentimes, you know, things can go awry, as we have an example of for myself that went viral. Thankfully, nobody got hurt. But you'll see this, and you probably will chuckle. But there's a lot of things that, you know, are uh, not very funny about what we do and what we have to put up with. And we're going to show that right now. Steve Kush live in Hollywood. Steve. Years ago, Mike and Cher, the measles is virtually eradicated the United States. I don't like being messed with, damn it. Stay out of my shot. I mean, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's not Bruce Valanche. That's not a crazy you know, woman. That's, that was some guy who just pulled up his car. I'm on Hollywood Boulevard in Orange. The guy pulled up his car, put it in park in the middle of the road, got out, and then just ran up behind me to shout something about, you know, I'll tell you he's going to be in the Oscars next year. I had no idea what he was going to say. I thought he was going to come up and curse or do something much worse. <laughs> Thankfully, it just ended in me, you know, pushing him out of the way, and my live shot went on as, as scheduled. Um, <laughs> you guys may have seen this before. Um, it was one of those things that went viral. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel had it, Jimmy Fallon, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, Web Soup, like all over the place. TMZ was playing it nonstop. All these radio stations wanted to talk about it the next day. Um, it's not something I'm really proud of. It's just something of that's, I take my job very seriously. You know, uh, every day we go out there and we've got a little baby. We've got our story that we have to work on and we have to develop. It's almost like a painting. It's an art piece, right? That we start off stroke by stroke, piecing it together, getting our interviews, getting the video we need. And then at the very, very end, before we can show it to the world, you got somebody who wants to come and tear it all down. And you only got one shot because, you know, if that guy would have gotten in front of me and, you know, the people behind in our studio would have instantly cut my feed, thrown to my story, I wouldn't have been able to say what I was supposed to say, and then I definitely wouldn't have been there for the tag either. So it would have destroyed my whole day's worth of work and my photographers and my producers planning, all because somebody wants to go be funny or be obscene or do whatever. You never know in this so, business. So thank you. So for one, one of the things that I guess is a common denominator in this discussion is that when we're in the field, we are planning something for a certain time to air. But we have to somehow be always ready for the unexpected, be it the fire, you know, jumping the freeway and going around us, or be it the, the person behind you yelling obscenities that you need to adapt to. So why don't we go, uh, we'll start with you, Pete, is how do you prepare for what's expected, unexpected danger versus an unexpected danger? There basically isn't any difference. It's called tactical awareness. Beverly's put it, you know, your head on a swivel, you're looking around. That's what you do. Whenever you come up on a story, you have a vague idea of what you think is going to happen. You're given an address and a possible instance of what is going to be. The minute you hit there, your mode, your mood, what you do changes. Eyes are wide open. What am I seeing? Don't get tunnel vision. Look at everything that is going on there. At the scene itself, where the information is flowing out of, and then the entire context of the whole picture in front of you and to either side. At nighttime, it's even more critical. You are looking around you everywhere, everything. You're looking for the guy hanging in the shadows, a group of two or three people over on the side. That's what you do. Assess the situation before you step out of the car or truck, before you turn on the microphone, bring the camera up or anything else. Assess the situation first. What, when, do you, when do you feel the most vulnerable? Because there are moments in which your awareness level needs to be higher. When is that moment? When you're in an area where there is something has occurred, when people's tempers are high, when they're flaring, or in a situation where everything is socially uncontrolled, case in point, an L.A. Lakers riot. Everyone is cheering, thinking the team's done great. 
Three seconds later, all of a sudden, it's turned into a riot where people are destroying property. They're assaulting people. No particular reason as to what set it off. And you're standing there with a microphone. You've got a target painted on you right there. Journalist, oh, gee whiz, that microphone looks like it's expensive. Or, gee, that radio equipment looks real something. Or, our colleague here, forget that, the camera looks real good, too. Or, gee, you know, he dresses real nice. He might have a nice watch on. I'm going to take that. You're thinking about all those things that can happen. And that's when you shift a third time. You keep the journalist aspect there. But you also look at what is called tactical journalism, preservation of, your, of self. And you're going to do whatever you have to do to take those steps. I've had people walk up and at the last minute try to do something, and I'll go <whistles> Which means very politely, if you take another step, something interesting is going to happen. <laughs> As Harrison Ford said, I got a bad feeling about this. <laughs> yeah, something bad will happen. Don't. You communicate with body language. Of course, I'm sitting down. Body language. Somebody 6'5", 260 goes, all of a sudden, it's, <whistles> wait a minute, back off a little. That's when it comes, that's when you're careful. But you have to do it preemptively. If you wait till they open their mouth, they're on a roll and you've lost control. So when, Beverly, do you draw the line in a way that they, under, they understand that you need your space to work? You're not as threatening as Pete, <laughs> but yet you get your message across. How, because the fact that you're, you've been able to handle it and you haven't, you haven't said any response to those um, insults or whatever they said on air makes you a great person to kind of hear about how do you handle that being a professional and dealing with the whatever is going on around you. I believe in preemptive strikes. Sometimes you approach people in advance and turn on the charm. Why are you here? You got questions about my story? Did you see what happened? Don't stand behind me because they'll mistake you for the criminal who's still being sought. Some folks will fall for that. Bingo. Sometimes. But every possible response before you call out the artillery, meaning my 300-pound photographer, who I typically work with, but he's a teddy bear. And I don't want to put him into that position where he has to stand between me and some knucklehead who might have a knife or a gun. We all want to go home at night, just like the cops we cover. With that in mind, we often have a plan B, which means leave the crime scene and go to the cop shop. That's not an expression of weakness. It's survival. You know, my producers common are real sense. cool with that. It is common sense, but on the TV tip, you have to plan ahead because you've got to drop that antenna, reel in those cables, collect those lights, run for the exits, and the cop shop may be 10 minutes away. And you hit at 1101, it's unrelenting. So planning ahead for all of that is what we're talking about. And again, being conscientious of your setting. It may be the nicest so-called neighborhood, but the knuckleheads will still come out when they see that bright light and a TV truck. It's almost an idiot magnet, for lack of a better word. <laughs> I'm not the first one to use that term, but you know, I think they called it that old SNL skit, Sniglets. We're, vid you know, we're vidiots. We bring out the vidiots. And that's not to disparage the general public, but folks who really want to go viral, now that that is a thing, see us as a path to that place where they've got a thousand followers and a gazillion followers because they ran up on Steve Kouge and Steve Kouge <laughs> strong armed them. I thought that was so cool. But. <laughs> I don't, want to, I don't want to go there because they might push me back and then it's on like Donkey Kong and then I'm unemployed. Because right. I don't know what I'm going to say on a hot mic. I don't really want to risk it. So, so you do try to plan ahead with your, your strategy and then your plan B for a new location to still serve the story because that's why we're here. Now let's, let's talk about empathy and sympathy from your news producers. If you're about to go live and you have one minute to hit, you're, you have the leading story and you are aware that it's not safe to go live. It, what, is, what are you hearing from I the shop? I have right of first refusal. That is not a negotiation. I'm out and I'm calling you as we leave. I'm not calling for permission. That is never the conversation we have with the producers back at the mothership. They know to trust us. Thousands of viewers trust us. Our producers need to do the same. Amen. Yeah, unfortunately not. not. <laughs> the reason why I ask, because in smaller markets where there are no unions, uh, reporters feel threatened to even call and say, um, there's, been, there's a car driving around, we are covering a drive-by sh uh, drive shooting, and um, there's a car going around, and it's just me and my photographer. Um, I'm glad that you 
you know, put up, put up, you know, set your gui your guidelines, your parameters. Say like, I'm leaving. I have the right to first refusal, but that's not the case in a lot of markets. So, I'm going to you, Molly. Um, when do you? How do you deal with resistance, if any, from your from your managers when they don't have the eyes and the feeling you do? How do you make the case um, that it's safer to not be there? I would say. I'm typically the person in charge of the live truck, and so I'm the one making that shot happen or not. And if it's not a safe situation, I have the authority to make that call to break the, down the live shot. Um, one instance comes to mind, I think it was like a uh, St. Paddy's Day or Mardi Gras. So the camera is a magnet, you know, it attracts good and bad, <laughs> and especially when you add a lot of alcohol to the situation. Um, you can get into a kind of a precarious situation. And so um, setting up the live shot, and I was working with a pretty attractive uh, female reporter. We're getting ready to do our live hit. And you know, there's turn the lights on, there's a big groups starting to mass up behind her. She starts getting, you know, pinched, smacked on the on her butt, basically, and really uncomfortable situation. This is about five minutes to air. So it there were no cops in sight. I literally had to basically delay the shot, call it off, and uh, we had to turn the lights off so to get the crowd to disperse a lot. And we ended up crawling or crawling, climbing on top of the news van just to get the shot done. So, you know, at least to please the news director. So we had that live presence, what they wanted, but at the same time, safety was the first priority because she, was, she felt very uncomfortable. So you kind of have to just go with the flow at each situation, but ultimately you're responsible, not just for yourself and your reporter, but if you're in a live truck with a microwave mass and a dish, you know, going up to the sky, you're also responsible for all those people that are on that circumference of that area, you know, if you put a live mass up into some wires and stuff like that, so you really have to... Make the call. Make the call, yeah. How receptive was your manager? They didn't like it. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about uh, I mean, basically, it was a phone call. Uh, they obviously saw what was happening, and they wanted us to, you know, continue the shot. But my reporter was freaked out. You know, she was getting basically harassed, costed, hit, touched. She was getting assaulted. assaulted. Let's, let's yeah. dispense with the niceties there. Yeah. Um, you know, they weren't pleased, but bottom line, I, I still, you know, I wasn't fired, and I made the right decision, and we still got the live shot up, and they still had the live presence that they wanted. It was just delayed a little bit, and, you know, the safety was first priority. We had a conversation about it the next day, and everybody, you know, agreed I did the right thing, which was nice. I had the support of my chief photojournalist and stuff like that. But, you know, ultimately, you're in charge out in the field. They don't they can't see what's happening. They don't know what's going on. So you really just have to make that call. Steve, um, yeah, one yeah, I just something. wanted to add, I think due to recent you know, tragic events where we've seen news crews attacked on live television, producers and news directors, executive producers, are much more understanding when we voice concern that we don't feel safe. Um, but before that, I really feel like, I, I, I remember being in the newsroom, and you know, hearing you know, a crew call in and say, hey, you know, we, we don't want to go live here, we don't feel safe here, we're going to move down the street. And then I'd, I'd hear pushback from some of the producers, some of the management saying, are, are you sure? You think, I mean, it's only t it's 10 minutes away. Could you just do it in 10 minutes? It's not going to be that big of a problem. And then you know, once the news crew finally says, no, no, we're going to the cop shop, it's, it's my call. You know, you know, the phone gets hung up, and then you hear some of the management or the producers saying, you know, it's talking, talking down about them, you know, that they should have gone, you know, this ruins the whole show, you know, all because, you know, I, I just don't get it. Why can't they do that? You know, there wasn't always that understanding that there's a danger when we're out there. What do you think, uh, Beverly, I was going to ask you then, Pete, what do you think about that disparity of understanding of what's going on? Why, if you become a manager, uh, you don't get that no, no story is worth risking somebody's safety. Why do, why do you think there is that distance between agreement that if you need to move, you need to move? Well, I'd like to uh, revisit your last question where you made it sound like it was a union issue, union markets versus non. As Steve just proved, it's not unique to large or small, union, non-union. Small minds are all over the place. And that's what that boils down to, people with the disrespect of your safety and your desire to go home at night. 
but having never been a reporter, which is the case these days, it seems for a lot of producers and assignment editors, there's no respect or appreciation for exactly what we do, and that may never change. So you have to have a constant conversation with these folks, not to belittle them, but to remind them, you don't know what I know, you don't walk in my shoes and my blues are not like yours. Because what we're facing in the field, from the knucklehead who licked my windshield one day to get my attention, that's never gonna happen in a newsroom. That's a nice antiseptic space where the weirdos really don't swarm like they do in the field from time to time. Expressing those dangers consistently, reminding them of the non-dangerous but weird encounters that we have, I think helps put what we're about in perspective because we really are the tip of the spear. The radio folks, the photographers, the reporters who are on the streets on a regular. So what do you we're the ones. So to anyone, anybody in the panel, what do you guys think that fits that pushback? That, it that feeds the pushback because you do not have any context for the people inside and what the outside is. Many of the people inside, producers, executive producers, assignment editors, people like that, NBT, NDT, no been there, no done that. We seriously, every single time over at KNX, we get a new person in on the on radio news exchange desk, one of the interns, even some of the writers and other reporters. They hand them over to me or another experienced reporter for a ride along to get a sense of what it is and how it works. And when it comes to tactical decisions in the field about if it's dangerous or not, I'm fortunate enough that my news director, my program director, my editors know if I say something is a little bit dicey, they take it absolutely saying, do what you have to do, leave, get out of there, whatever. What should be done and what should start getting into management is that nobody who is on the inside should stay on the inside without getting out in the field at least two to three days a year on an unpredicted, unscheduled basis. You have an assignment editor who walks in, oh yeah, I'm going to do this, I'm going to arrange this and that. No, you're going out with Beverly tonight, you're going to be at 115th and Grape Street at 11 o'clock at night after three people have been shot and a baby's been killed and you're gonna have to be there and no, no, you're not gonna be in the van sitting there cowering like a house mouse. You're gonna be out there helping the crew, helping her doing what has to be done. Knocking on doors, uh, knocking on doors and seeing if people want to talk to you. Once they have that kind of a reality check, all of a sudden their attitude changes. That is something, in many ways, it's not just a union thing, but as the union helps us to the idea of keeping our safety factor there, this is something that should be pushed to management to make sure there is an understanding of what goes on out in the field, not just what happens is it's got to go in on the newsroom says it has to be done. You've got to have calluses, you've got to have stripes, and you've got to have scars. If you don't, I'm sorry, you're not in a position to make a decision that's going to affect me or my life. Now that you mentioned that the danger is out there and you have all of this on the table. I no. I'm wondering if Beverly has all of this as well. In the trunk of my car, the, yes. Yeah. Why do you carry it around with you all the time, Pete? You're looking at that all the time. Boots, safety helmet, Nomex. Nomex head for the fires and that type of thing. First aid kit, because you might need it, somebody else might need it. Binoculars, because sometimes long distance is the next best thing to being there. You really want to go up on a bomb call and get close? Not when something's coming at you at 25,000 feet per second, but the time you hear the flash and hear, or hear the bang and see the flash, you're already dead because the frag's through you. Body armor. It's threat level 3A with steel plates front and back. It'll stop anything up to 1,900 feet per second. That's just short of what an AK throws at you. Do you need it? Absolutely. Most people don't use heavy weapons on the street, but if a bullet's flying your way, I'd rather have that than this. We've had some rather interesting examples of reporters who've been up with, uh, how shall I phrase it, special weapons teams looking for suspects, and all of a sudden bullets are flying, and all they've got are their press credentials and a well-coiffed hairdo. Well, neither one of those are going to save your life. That will. Keep in mind, that's concealable body armor. If I put that thing on and then slap on that green vest, nobody's going to know I have it. And has it saved my life at times? A couple of times. I've been shot at at least a half a dozen times in my career, but the physical assault, that also comes in handy. Realistically, eight years ago, I had a guy in the middle of a street protest. He didn't like one thing that I was doing out there, and he came up on me and he swung on me, thinking he's going to knock the wind out of me and then kick the crap out of me. He made a mistake. The mistake was this. He hit this. Steel. With his hand. 
Well, after he screamed and yelled that he'd broken my hand, I said, ain't that just really too bad? And I had a 635 Sennheiser right across the nose. Boom, he went down. Hey, that's the power of the press. Sometimes, it's not every time, but sometimes, occasionally, you're gonna have to make an impression on somebody. That's one way to do it. It's very rare, but be prepared. Beverly, is there something you carry that it, it's a must for you, that to have always with you and your crew? Yes, in my lunch kit, I also carry a yellow vest, just like the one you see on the end of the table there. Because I don't rock Kevlar, I do have a helmet and boots and a bunch of the other things you see here. But every day without fail, that yellow vest is in my lunch kit, which means I'm never without it. Because we're on the side streets, in the dark, and if a headlight hits you, that is a lifesaver. I try not to stand in the roadway when I can help it, but sometimes they will block a freeway for an incident, and then we can stand there, and some knucklehead will inevitably run past the orange cones and take out a CHP unit because they're distracted by the news trucks. Why risk it? That van is, forgive me, that, that vest is a lifesaver, so it doesn't weigh much. It rolls into a nice, tidy package in a Ziploc bag, fits in my lunchbox everywhere I go. And there's also the other side of it. That identifies you in one way, not just at night. If you have a street situation, protests, something like that, you have your company's logo on it, something like that, the police can spot you, see not you. Not always a good thing. But not I always a good thing, but to some extent, <laughs> and I'll get into that in a minute, but it, it is something where they can spot, it'll catch their eye, and they'll go, oh, wait a minute, microphones, okay, that's the press. That's not one of the bad people we're out here to either arrest or to drive down. Avoid them, leave them alone. It is one of those things that occasionally comes in handy. Occasionally. One of the things that I like to emphasize that happened in L.A., because it could have only happened in L.A., we were covering an, an immigration rally in MacArthur Park. And because we Maybe. had a media, we had a media uh, badge, a media microphone, a, uh, a media vest, we were actually the targets of the LAPD. Over 56 uh, journalists were hurt, uh, seven from my station, 11 from Telemundo, and we were the targets. We became the targets of something that we weren't supposed to be part of. We were covering a rally and police, and of course, we were rolling and we saw police grabbing the camera they're supposed to respect, grabbing the microphone they're supposed to respect, and throwing it and hitting the photographer, hitting the, um, the radio broadcaster. And that's how unpredictable this is. I mean, when we're out there, even the team that you feel you're with becomes the team that is not with you. One thing also on the context of that was the 2007 May Day riot in MacArthur Park. One reason why that happened, believe it or not, while the reporters, the camera people, things like that were experienced, many of the police officers who swept through that park that day were not trained. That was one of the things in the 96-page report which pointed out they had not gone to the advanced training schools for civil disturbances. They had not been given training by the media relations people. All they saw was a crowd of people ahead of them, and all they heard from their commanders was, clear that park. It didn't matter who it was. If they'd been given proper training, well, the LAPD would have probably been saved, I don't know how many millions of dollars in lawsuits on that one. But again, even so, Sometimes it happens to where the cops have blinders. They don't care that this is here. They don't care that 409.5 subsection D of the California Penal Code says, I've got a right to be here when those people don't. The blinders are a problem. And in many ways also, one way you make sure that you're safe on the street, you see the people there wear badges, carry guns occasionally, walk up, chat with them for 30 seconds or 90 seconds. Let them know you're here. Believe it or not, you'll make friends with them, and 15 feet, 15 years down the line, yeah, I remember you. Yeah, go ahead, do what you want. Not a problem. It helps a little. Steve, is there anything in the last three years that you feel that has changed when it comes to safety out there on the field? I think we were kind of brushing on this earlier, where, you know, within the last year, we've had a uh, a massive increase in people who want to photobomb us. They want to get on, whether it's the radio or behind our camera, or grab our microphones away from us and shout, you know, horribly, you know, sexist and just, just disgusting things. You know, the effer and the pee thing that's been been going around. Um, that was all based off of 
you know, a series of online viral videos that were meant to be jokes, but you know, people who watch that kind of thing think, you know what, maybe I can do that. Maybe I can get a million views. Look at all my friends who are watching this right now. I can go to school the next day and brag about it. I um, made YouTube. At, at least, yeah. I would say, this is going to sound crazy, but probably at least five, six times a week, I hear somebody come by and shout that. You know, it's usually once a day. Sometimes it's multiple times a day where someone screams, comes by and screams, Effer right in the pee, you know. Oh, was, did that make the air? Was that on the air? Well, sometimes it is, sometimes it doesn't. And we have to maintain our cool while this is happening. And especially, you know, when we're trying to go live and you've got these, these kids coming up on you or just standing on the sides, you have no idea what anybody's going to do anymore. You know, um, and one more thing I would say is uh, after all the, the protests have been happening, um, you know, the anti-police protests, the anti-murder you know murder protests, they started, I think, with really uh, the Trayvon Martin shooting in Florida. Um, I think a lot of us probably remember being out in Lamert Park that night where uh, KCBS's investigative reporter Dave was attacked. Somebody ran up on a CBS <coughs> reporter and I believe uh, socked his photographer, sucker punched his photographer full speed in the back of the head and that sent the camera you know, flying into uh, reporter Dave's face and both of them had to go to the hospital that night. You know? And we're faced with more and more of the, these protests where uh, the situation, it isn't predictable. You know, we have those predictable stories where we're going to a standoff or we're going to, you know, we're going to a bad neighborhood where there was a shooting. Yeah, the shooting was three hours ago. It's safe now. Police have cleared it out. But in a protest situation, there is a huge list of things that could happen to us that you really can't plan for. You just have to, like, like Pete said, keep your head on a swivel and keep looking out for what's coming at you because you don't know. The only other problem, and this is something that unfortunately... I'm old enough to remember that when television trucks and live trucks here were all the same color, white. There were no identifying markings on them at all. Then all of a sudden the marketing geniuses in these stations said, hey, we have action camera number seven, and it's a blue bullseye. And it announces in screaming tones, we are the media. Well, yeah, that's great advertising, but it also advertises to people that we don't necessarily want to advertise to that you're there. It draws unwanted attention. We actually, at our shop right now, we are in the process of changing over mobile units, and so far, none of them have any identifying marks at all. I like it. I liken it to the F-117. They can't see you on radar. They can't see at all. I've gone into places with a simple Chevy Tahoe with semi-dark windows on the back, one or two small antennas. Nobody knows who I am. I get in there, do what I have to do, get my information, get back, and either I'm right there, no one pays any attention, or I'm gone, and I'm out. That's something some of these organizations should start to think about. Sometimes it doesn't pay to advertise. And that's before you guys set out cameras and lights and everything else, which naturally draws interest from people. And there are times when, you know, whatever station or call letters we have in our mic flag makes us a target. I think Fox reporters here in Los Angeles Absolutely. have taken a huge brunt of that. You know, anyone with a Fox mic flag shows up to a Black Lives Matter protest, like my wife Christine here has several times, yep. or Hal Eisner over there. Instantly the crowd turns on him, thinking, oh, you're, you know, you're with the conservative media, you're out to make us look bad, you know, we don't even want you here. Look it up in your faces if they see, you know, you're working for Fox, or they have, you know, even the slightest inkling that you might be out to, you know, portray the story in a way that they don't want. So one of the things, I, I like to kind of move on to possible solutions or recommendations you, might, you, you guys might have for us on how to adjust to the dangers that we face. Like one of the things that we've done at Univision, since we are the station that covers the border the most because of our audience, I go to the border at least uh, five, five times a week. And I go to the Tijuana, I know the, all the borders, all ports of entry, all CBP stuff. And uh, we actually, I requested by in writing that one of our news vans should be, a new van should be bought and nothing put on it. Because the, by the third month I was covering Tijuana, uh, we were followed by the government, we were followed by the police, we were questioned, stripped down, and asked serial numbers that not even uh, when you go into the U.S. they ask you that. And they were actually really good at, at, at just, uh, who is leaving to Tijuana, give them unit number nine, which is the white van 
nothing in it. Uh, you go into Tijuana, I think you're a tourist. You get, you do your interviews, you're done. You, you, you go back and report from San Diego. So I think that's, I, I think that's a great thing that your station is doing. And we have to adjust not just to the market, but what we're exposed to. I wonder, Beverly, if there's anything being done um, in your case when there's at least a conversation going on of how to deal with more safety for you guys. It's a constant conversation, but I don't want to imply that it's profound disrespect. It's not. People get it inside my newsroom, what we're up against. They've seen examples in the outtakes. They've seen it on TV, not just our station, but others. So I believe there is a familiarity now and an appreciation for the danger. So I don't believe that we're running into brick walls anymore. Not that we ever really were. But the tools we need are being provided. The training is constant. The not getting on the roof of the live truck is just the tip of the iceberg. The things that we're being taught now from intern all the way to management, everybody has to learn how to clear Oh, what, to safely evacuate from the live van, even if you never roll in the live van on your job. My training session is coming up this week. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, jump out and you shuffle your the feet. The hop. Right, you do the bunny hop to stay safe so there's no electricity, you know, the, the conduit, all of that, all of those things that we learned the hard way. Right. When our colleague at KABC here in LA suffered critical injuries, when she was electrified, when her antenna touched the wires overhead on a routine thumb sucker story at the cop shop. Most of us who were here will never forget that because the vehicle was smoking and she was being yelled at by civilians, run, get out, it's about to explode. And when she did that, she almost died. She almost died. So those lessons stay with us. And although management churns, colleagues churn, some of these lessons are now organic. They are part of our DNA. When it comes to the idea of safety overall at our shop, we have an advantage. Our news director listens and our management listens and they provide Nomex, they provide hard hats, goggles. The rest of the stuff you see up here, for the most part, I've bought on my own because I value my life more than my corporation does. And if you go into a situation without the tools necessary, don't be surprised if you're not going to wind up injured or dead. I advise, actually, when it comes to body armor, I brought it into my shop and said, look, this can happen. I even brought in an expert to said, look, we'll provide it for you and we'll actually custom measure it and tailor it. And we've had three of our reporters who have done that. I mean, they've taken my lead on this thing. And the same thing is true for these other things. Plus, I've also given lists of things to various reporters. For example, little saline bottles there. Real nice, right? But try this one. Anybody know what this is? Vodka? Nope. <laughs> this is Johnson Nose Tears Lather. And this is a combination of saline and baby shampoo. You get pepper spray in the eyes or you get tear gas, you go like that, you blink, no tears lather, and it will get out of there. Rather than do this and rub your eyes and all of a sudden you're incapacitated for 45 minutes to an hour. That type of stuff, that type of lesson, we're passing about through institutional knowledge. Those of us with a little gray hair and little field experience, like Bev, the same thing. We tell the new people, these are some of the things you need to consider putting into the gear. This gear may be totally, what I'd say, about $1,000, $1,100. Mm -hmm. How much is your life worth? And the companies are realizing that now. Not to provide this is dumb. It doesn't make sense at the bottom line. If you send a reporter in and they get injured, when these tools are available and you give them to them, people can cover it safely. Push the envelope, but not push through it to the point where you get hurt. One of the things you just mentioned about how much this is worth and how much is your life. I don't know if you guys realize when you guys travel, but I have realized that every time I travel, they make sure they, that they, the station insures the vehicle, insures the equipment, insures everything that you take. But they never ask you, do you need insurance? Does your family know that you're going to go do a kidnapping ransom story where you might end up kidnapped? Do we have ransom insurance? Nothing, nothing like that. So yes, corporations will prioritize, and it's usually not on the reporting, but on the story that is going to be reported. They want to insure his camera, not necessarily the reporter in front of it. There was an accident one day by one of our crews, and I was in the, just like uh, you, like working around the, the newsroom, and I heard like, what, what happened? Oh, you had an accident. Is the camera okay? <laughs> oh, God. And I was like, 
I hate to say that sounds like blazing saddles, you right. know, with the sidecar going into right. the quicksand. They want to rescue that rather and than the man. I, okay, I, right. I stood my ground and I told the assignment desk, can you ask him if he's okay? Can you please ask him that? Because, you know, he's my, I know that photog for a long time. It's like, ask him. He's like, hey, you know, are you okay? He's okay. I'm like, we'll talk about that. And we did have a conversation. It's, so the corporations are there to secure their assets. And, and we are their assets. And we are assets that make them be who they are. Uh, I think that Pete, Beverly, Maui, and, and uh, Steve contribute something to their companies that they like about them. And they should value that at all costs, including that when something is lost, property should be the secondary thing of their worries, and us should be their first, pri uh, their primary worry. Uh, Maui, have you adjusted anything in uh, San Diego when it comes to safety? Uh, our station, along with many others, uh, started having a uh, mandatory attendance for a, a gentleman named Mark Bell. He gives a little ENG safety kind of, it's like a four hour, five hour kind of uh, presentation. Uh, I believe it's engsafety.com or something like that. But we literally had to go to this course, sign off on it, you know, make sure that, and it, it was a yearly thing. So any new updates, technology, and, it, it was very valuable and helpful information to have. So it's, I would highly recommend not, you know, just this person and their company, but something like that, you know, have some kind of training for those instances. Steve? Um, you know, there's one thing I really would like to discuss, and that's the issue of hazard pay, you know. Um, I think we definitely need to redefine what qualifies as hazard pay. I mean, you look at some of the stuff that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, traffic vests, so we don't get run over. Fire gear, so we don't get burned alive. Hard hats, so we don't crack our skull open when we're working a difficult construction scene. All of this gear, all right, and how often have you actually been awarded hazard pay? How many, you know, protests and marches have you gone to where people are getting 40 attacked? 40 years, never. Yeah, yeah. Never. I, I think it's never absolutely happened. ridiculous. I remember going to my HR director and saying, hey, we had a reporter right next to me get attacked tonight. This was a dangerous situation you put me in. Does that qualify for hazard pay? They said, no, no, it only qualifies for hazard pay if it is uh, designated an actual riot. <laughs> Excuse me? Like, they it, want to you see know, the paperwork? <laughs> what, I, had, I, I was there shooting video on my phone of people running up and smashing windows, breaking windows, um, hitting, punching people on the street. You know, that's not a safe place to be in. Or let's talk about all the wildfires we go to. You know, in, in, in Los Angeles, some, you know, the, the people who um, you know, are most passionate about the jobs get really, really close to the fire. I mean, I've been able to um, reach out and touch the fire at, at points. You get so close. There was one point uh, we actually had to pull the live truck back to like a safe zone because the fires had completely surrounded us and we had to go to a park where there wasn't any trees or flammable material that could, you know, burn near us to save our lives. That doesn't qualify for hazard pay, you know? But yet the reporter who gets to stay in-house working a political story, you know, gets paid the same amount as the rest of us who are out there risking our necks. And I think that really needs to change. And I think, I'm sure a I lot of people in here who've had those yeah, similar think, uh, experiences would agree with that. I think it's a valid question for, um, for our union to consider uh, to further discuss and develop as far as what is hazard, define hazard in what pay are we talking about. I, but I think you make a great point. Uh, it's not fair. Now that I think about it, it's like, why isn't everyone going to the border? Why is it me? Why is all, you know? <laughs> why, why is it? And I'm not the only one that knows where the border is. You know, people need to go there too. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for bringing that up. And I think this discussion brings up, um, I mean, and, you know, to the union uh, leaders that, this is something we got to kind of talk about in the future. Yeah, I would do, as we close this out, I do want to uh, mention that Beverly mentioned the thing about aggregating stories and uh, all of us or members in our shops submitting stories of incidents that they deal with. We already have that ability on the sag After webpage. There is a part of the sag After webpage called Safety for Media. That's the number four, Safety for Media. And uh, there is a space on there where you, any reporter, anybody around the country can submit a safety concern, a safety issue that they have faced so that people around the country 
can see in the various markets what has happened. Now, I think it's also a good idea, and maybe we ought to think about something to set up within local markets and ways of communicating information to our members within our locals, but uh, there, I just want to let you know there is that space on our national webpage right now, and so I would advise you and encourage you to do that if you can. But I really want to thank Julio and everybody else uh, for taking part in this panel. This was magnificent. Thank you.